So I can move to the second part of this uh, fantastic summary from session of the Lisa Symposium. Uh, we will be starting again. So uh, if you want to share your, uh, share your uh, screen, Lorena. Um, yes, I'll do that. All right, so the next speaker will be Lorena Marina Zatuj from the University of Mississippi, uh, talking about high precision uh, read on fitting. So you have 15 minutes, and I will tell you a few minutes before the end, uh, the time you have left. The floor is yours. Okay, thank you very much. Um, so my name is Lorena Marina Zatuj, and I will tell you about ring down fitting and all of this. Uh, that I will be telling you about is on recent work uh, that I did in collaboration with uh, Keith Mitman, Niv Keda, and Leo Stein, who is my advisor. So uh, let me begin by asking the question, why are we interested in Ringdown? So we're interested in Ringdown because uh, it provides us with nice calculations uh, using perturbation theory that can help us understand uh, the random properties of a binary black hole system. And because of that, it provides us with a nice way to test GR. Um, it also gives us an independent test uh, for, for uh, when we're talking about like the in spiral, we can find the remnant parameters with the in spiral. We can estimate those. And with ring down, we can also get an estimate on what the remnant parameters are. And we can independently uh, compare the two. And that gives us also a consistency check between uh, perturbation theory and numerical relativity. We're also interested in studying this because there will be you know, three uh, third generation detectors. And of course, Lisa, that will be sensitive to many more ring down frequencies. And uh, because of that, we want to make sure that we are, we are ready with uh, very precise renal models that we can take advantage of. So let me begin by just giving a quick overview on quasi normal modes. Uh, so a ring down waveform can be described uh, mathematically in such a way where it depends on this quasi normal mode amplitude that depends on the mode LMN. Uh, it also depends on this uh, decaying sinusoidal, which uh, has this quasi normal mode frequency. And then we have the last term, which is a function, a spin weight function, which is a spheroidal harmonic. Now, we, instead of working in uh, with spheroidal harmonics, we switch over to our spherical harmonic functions here. Uh, but the trade off is that we then have to have uh, take into account this uh, CLL prime M, which is our spherical spheroidal mixing coefficient, uh, to go from one function to the other. And uh, we do this for two reasons. Uh, the first reason is just because all the numerical relativity waveforms are already in uh, spherical harmonics. So it's just easy to use it in that sense. Uh, the second, second reason uh, is very important. So all of the frequencies that we're working with are actually complex. They're not purely imaginary or purely real. And so since they are complex and the spheroidal uh, functions do not necessarily form a complete basis, but the spherical harmonics do. Uh, so, we, so we switch this. So now how do we get each of these uh, ingredients uh, into our model? So we have to solve for Tchaikovsky's equation, which is a second order partial differential equation that luckily can be decomposed into the radial, angular, and temporal uh, equations. So typically people use Lever's method, which is a continued fraction technique, oops, sorry, um, to solve for both the radial and the angular sectors. Uh, but we instead just use it for the radial sector and we employ something called uh, a spectral eigenvalue method, uh, which is actually outlined in Cook and Zaletsky in my reference down here. Uh, and so the advantage of using that is that it's very fast. But also, uh, while we are solving for the quasi normal mode frequencies, we're also able to solve for these spherical spheroidal mixing coefficients simultaneously. So it's kind of a two for one deal. And so uh, by the time we solve this, we already have our, our quasi normal mode frequencies. We have our spherical, uh, spherical spheroidal mixing coefficients, and we already know what the spherical harmonics are. So the only thing that we are really missing at this point is our amplitudes. And that's what we do fits for. So uh, just to kind of put everything together before moving on. So uh, we have 
in, in ring down, we have to take into account retrograde modes. Uh, this is something that I will not speak too much about, but essentially each quasi-normal mode frequency has two solutions, uh, a prograde and a retrograde. And usually people look at the prograde solution. Um, the, the retrograde solution is only important in some systems. Uh, in others, it, it has a very small contribution, but either way, we take it into account. Uh, we also look, uh, take into account the spherical spherical mixing coefficient, and we look at different overtones for our fits. And there are, there are a lot of papers that uh, I didn't get all of them on here, but I at least got uh, quite a few of papers that have looked at all of these, um, all of these uh, key ingredients, if not more than one, uh, one combined. So what I will show here is two things. Uh, first, I will show how we fit uh, multiple modes, how our, data, how our algorithm works. And then I will tell you a little bit about uh, uh, how we fix the BMS frame. So these are the two main features of our, of our paper. So just to show you how this works. So we take, a, take your favorite NR waveform and you rank the LM modes by power. So which one has the most power? Uh, then you take the one with the most power, which is usually the 2 2 mode, 2 2 0 uh, mode for, for many waveforms. And then we try to fit for the mode amplitudes by minimizing the residual power. So that is, we take this numerical relativity waveform and we subtract from it our model using the loudest mode. Once we minimize that, we take the amplitude that uh, minimizes this equation and build an analytical waveform. Once we have our waveform, we can easily find the fraction of unmodeled power uh, by, by this equation. And also very easily, we can just figure out what the mismatch is. Uh, however, if we're not happy with just modeling the 2-2 mode, uh, we go back to this step and we take the second loudest mode, which could be a higher harmonic, or it could also be the next, uh, the, the following overtone. Uh, it just depends. It really depends on the waveform. So we do this essentially, and it's what we call a greedy algorithm to try to pick, instead of picking the modes manually, which we can do, uh, we try to find a different approach for this. So that is, uh, that is the, uh, the feeding algorithm of multiple modes over all times. Uh, on the two sphere. Now we move on to the frame fixing part. So I've mentioned that we work with, uh, with, uh, with waveforms and you're probably thinking, okay, well, we work in this, in this blue region, um, but that's actually not the waveform we look at. We instead look at waveforms that are more like this. So the difference between the two is just a different method to extract these waveforms. So on the left side, you have your typical extrapolated waveforms, which are the ones that, uh, you know, have always essentially been used. Uh, but uh, in SXS, we've started moving towards also making available the CCE waveforms. So Cauchy characteristic extraction uh, waveforms. These waveforms are important because uh, they include this uh, memory effect. Uh, and this displacement memory is something that is not present in extrapolated waveforms, just from the construction of how one extracts the waveforms. But you will notice here that uh, it seems that our ring down is now shifted upwards. So clearly there's there's something weird there. It's not going to zero as, as we want it to go. Uh, and this is because uh, it is, it's, it's super translated. The remnant black hole is super translated with respect to the to the PN uh, post-Newtonian frame. And so what are these, what is this super translation? So uh, this is a, this is from the BMS group, so the bondi messner sachs group, which is your, it's an infinite dimensional group uh, for future null infinity when you have asymptotically flat space times. So in math speak, it's a, a semi-direct product of the Lorentz uh, group and super translation group. Um, so essentially we know that uh, black hole remnants are uh, in simulations are super translated with respect uh, to the remnants that Tukolsky's equation uh, was working in. So in Tukolsky's equation, you don't care about the past history of a black hole. Uh, you just have the black hole in, in a, its rest frame, essentially. And so when we have waveforms that look like this, that's clearly not in the rest frame because it's been super translated. So we have to do a BMS transformation from, uh, from this super translated frame to what is called the black hole's super rest frame. 
And once it's in its super rest frame, we can do the, the ring down analysis. Um, and this is kind of uh, what the super translations do. So you're maybe wondering how that affects the strain. Uh, we've seen it visually, but how it can affect, uh, how mathematically it can affect a ring down analysis. So if you do a super translation, uh, you have this angle dependent time translation. U here is the Bondi time. Uh, so it's not just like a shift in space fully. There's also some mode mixing effect. And you can see it here. You have mode mixing of your strain plus this, this constant shift. So what does this mean for our analysis? So let me just show you how important it is to map to the correct frame. Uh, so here we have in blue, this is an numerical relativity uh, waveform mode. This is a two zero mode. And if you're interested in the model, it's the 0305, which is a proxy for uh, GW150914. So the two zero mode always, uh, it's, it's known to have the most memory, to display the most memory. And you can see here that at the end of the ring down, the waveform does not go to zero. Uh, and this is because it is super translated. This is just a regular CC waveform. And so when we try to fit it with our model, which is this orange dashed line, you notice that our model really struggles to actually uh, to, to try to do something similar. And in the end, it just gives up and decays down to zero. Uh, indeed, the residuals are also very high, so we are not really doing too much here. If instead we translate this to the super rest frame, we now have our numerical relativity, uh, relativity waveform mode going to zero. And when we try to model it, our model has a much easier time. And indeed, the residual starts going uh, two orders of magnitude and, and less improvement. And uh, sorry, you want to look at the black line here. If you just do the constant, if you just do a shifting, then you get the red line, which is still pretty good, but it's not the right thing to do. Uh, so what happens when you combine this multi-mode uh, algorithm and frame fixing? So we try to see the importance of, uh, of doing uh, using multiple modes. So here we have plotted the fraction of unmodeled power, but we've done it in the news domain. And the reason why we did this in the news domain is because power is naturally defined there. Uh, so it's just a more natural, uh, natural thing to look at. And on the x-axis, we have essentially the time at which our model begins. So um, in the previous talk, uh, they've mentioned that uh, you don't really we don't really know when ring down begins. So it's important that we look at all of these different times um, just to see what the behavior is like. So just, if you just, just tell you, you have a few minutes left. Okay, thank you. Uh, if you look at the, at, the, at the solid lines, you will notice that with five modes, uh, you still have a lot of, uh, on a the fraction of our model power is still very high, but as you increase the number of modes you have to 20, 50, and 100, you start modeling or you start capturing more power in your waveform. So here are just some numbers uh, just to tell you. So you can capture 98% of the power in your waveform with five modes, but you can do much more than that. You just start adding uh, a larger number of modes. Uh, so, okay, we can pop, we can, get the power of the waveform, but what does that mean for the mismatch? So we've done essentially the same plot, but we've done it with a mismatch. And now we're back to looking at the strain as well, no, no longer the news function. So it's not surprising that as you add more and more modes, uh, the mismatch of your model decreases because you're modeling, you're capturing more power. Uh, just for reference here, I added two lines that show, so this purple dash dotted line that shows if you just use a 220 and 2 minus 20 modes, what this looks like, what your mismatch looks like. And I've also done the same for the overtone number. And these are all mode mismatches. Uh, so clearly you, you start tapering out. So it's really important to add more than just the overtones. Uh, it's important to add the overtones, but it's also important to add higher harmonics. And okay, so our mismatches look really low. Oh, I should mention uh, our mismatches, uh, start going very low, especially at times after like 15 M or so. Uh, but to make sure that we are not overfeeding, we have this uh, kind of grayish uh, blue black uh, curve at the bottom. And this shows a numerical error. So uh, by not going below this, we're, we're okay with, uh, with not worrying about overfeeding. Uh, and now we want to recover some parameters. So if you just take the 220 mode, you notice that uh, the error in your 
in your estimation in your parameter recovery is quite high. And here we look at the, the masses and the spin magnitudes to calculate the error. And we do this for 86 simulations in this surrogate model and our hybrid 3D Q8. As you add more and more overtones, you will notice that, for example, the median in your error starts decreasing. But if instead you add 40 modes that include higher harmonics, not just the 2-2 two -two mode, you can bring this down to, to uh, a much lower order of magnitude. And it's kind of hard to push even lower. Uh, even if you are mode, uh, if you add more modes, you cannot really push too much lower on the errors. So this is this is already a very good improvement. And the last uh, results I want to show. Uh, so this is just how important the super rest frame is when when doing this multi mode fitting. So on the on the horizontal axis, you have all different systems. Most of them are Q equals one, but you have some Q equals four. Uh, systems here with varying spins. Um, and at the end, we have GW15914 just, uh, just for comparison. So let's, I guess, let's ignore the bottom panel and just look at the top panel. Um, if you look at the mismatch between numerical relativity and um, our, mo our model with 100 modes, you will notice that the mismatches for extrapolated waveforms are quite low on the order of 10 to the negative 6, maybe 10 to the negative 5. Um, and if you use CC waveforms, which are these waveforms that look that are super translated? You actually get really bad mismatches, but that's not very surprising because you're in the wrong in the wrong frame. If then you do a BMS transformation to the super rest frame, you start getting these uh, blue bars, and so you actually get uh, much better mismatches than if you use extrapolated waveforms, which is not very surprising. Uh, uh, so because they are they, they are more correct uh, to use for for a ring down. Um, so let me just finish with a summary. So it is important to uh, model multiple modes uh, to be able to take a, advantage uh, in future detections, especially because each system, depending on the parameters, uh, may consider different modes more impo important. Uh, by being able to greedily model, uh, 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 model make a model, one can get a five order of magnitude improvement over just picking uh, maybe you know one mode or two modes uh, by hand. Additionally, if we include waveforms that are in the super rest frame, CC waveforms that are in the super rest frame, we can also get a five order of magnitude improvement there uh, on the mismatches. And so we will be packaging all of our code uh, and make it publicly available. So if people want to uh, build their own models, uh, whether they want to pick their modes or pick a specific number of modes, uh, they can do that. Uh, but we haven't begun doing that. It's just, we've just started talking about it. So it, it will be a while. Um, and we're also currently working on building a ring down surrogate model uh, that hopefully will be useful for Lisa and, uh, and for other detectors. And that is all. Thank you. I'd be happy to take any questions. Thank you very much. Uh, for this very interesting talk. Uh, we have a little bit of a time, but uh, we have time for at least one question. Uh, I don't see one so far. Um, I would have one myself. So you, you have a, a greedy um, algorithm looking for different modes and uh, potentially various sets of overtones. Um, how continuous is the result when you change uh, parameters? If you move from a from waveform to a neighboring waveform, uh, do you uh, extract the same set of modes and overtones, or do you uh, end up with a different set of modes and overtones? Yeah, so that's a good question. We haven't looked at it in detail, but we have looked at uh, a few um, a few of the of waveforms. So more or less, the top maybe. For vanilla like uh, waveforms, you get very similar modes being the most important, especially like the top three, the top five modes more or less are about the same. Uh, however, when you start having systems that have recession or are like anti-aligned, you will have different modes. Uh, for example, if you have a, a system that's very high in mass ratio and has a high, uh, high negative spin, you're gonna get the retrograde modes to be more important than the prograde modes, um, but it, it really depends on on the on the mass ratio because 
but for most, I think the two two mode is always there, and then it just depends. The two zero mode, for example, that exhibits memory is more important in some in some cases than others. But we have not done a, a thorough study on that yet. We're working okay. on it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, so I'm looking, but it doesn't appear that we have other questions. Uh, all right, so let's thank Lorena again for this uh, very nice talk. And uh, we're going to move on to the next speaker, uh, who is Massimo Vagliu. Do you want to share your, uh, your slides? Yes, sure. All right, so the next speaker okay. is Massimo uh, Vaglio from uh, Master di Roma Pinza, and he's going to talk about supremacy bosons stars as the targets concerning multiple moments and scalar interactions. So you have a 15 minutes. I will tell you a few minutes before the end. Uh, the floor is this. So, uh, hi everyone, I'm Massimo Vaglio from, from Sapienza University of Rome, and uh, first of all, I would like to thank you, the, the organizers, for the opportunity of giving these talks and and also uh, everyone who is connected and interested to, the, to this topic. So I will talk about supermassive boson stars as the targets and about the possibility of constraining multiple moments and scalar interactions with the with future observations. So the motivation for, for this work comes from the fact that gravitational waves allow to probe the nature of compact objects with the unprecedented accuracy. And this in turn, in turn gives us the opportunity to test some theoretical models which have been proposed to represent a compact alternative to black holes, so to, to challenge the, the black hole paradigm. And that have been developed in different theoretical frameworks, but each of them uh, implying the presence of some new physics yet to be discovered that would come into play, and so, uh, which is uh, an intriguing possibility. One of the, of the way in which the uh, gravitational waves uh, carry information about the nature about the inner structure of the compact objects is through uh, their multiple moments, which is through the multiple moments of the com of compact objects, which affect the, their dynamics when they are in binary systems and in turn the, the, the gravitational wave emission. So for example, if you are dealing with stationary and asymmetric objects, then the surrounding space-time will be characterized by two sets of scalar quantities, which are the mass and current moments, which for example, for a pair of black hole satisfy this simple relation here where chi is the dimensional spin and then is just the, the mass of the object. But this will be in general not true for a generic compact object since so deviation from, uh, from the, the, the black hole value can be, um, can be a signature of a, of a detection of one of these objects with the gravitational waves. So I will focus on a particular class of compact objects which are uh, boson stars, which are which can be defined as solutions of the Einstein gravity minimally coupled to a, a complex color field described by uh, this Lagrangian. Uh, the equation describing their equilibrium configurations, which in general uh, require numerical methods to, to be solved, are just the, the Einstein equation plus this uh, Klein-Gordon-like equation, uh, in which V is the, the potential term, which contains the the mass term of the, of the field as well as uh, as well as uh, self interactions, and here self interactions for for the stars play an analogous role to what the equation state uh, does for different stars in the sense that different self interactions give rise to different families of photon stars with different characteristics. So for example, the way in which the the maximum the maximum mass allowed for the model scales with the with the mass of the boson and eventually with the coupling constants of the theory. Uh, to have stationary and, axism and axisymmetric configurations uh, of the space-time, one has to assume this, uh, this answer for the scalar field, where this n of r is called the uh, azimuthal winding number, and it has to be an integer. And omega is just is the, the angular frequency of the, of the field. So the case that we studied is the one in which uh, the self-interactions take the form of a quartic self-coupling term. And we also studied the, the, the large self-coupling limit. And this is because this is the region of the parameter space where these configurations are expected to be 
uh, to be stable and also which allow for uh, the most uh, compact and massive configurations. And in this approximation, the coupling constant of the theory can be completely uh, factored out from the numerical calculation to appropriate scalings. And one can also apply a convenient method to solve the equation, which have been uh, applied to this class of boson star in this, uh, in this reference here, uh, which is a self-consistent field method, which basically means that after having uh, introduced a suitable line elements, like, like uh, these Papa Petro coordinates, which are expressed in, in which the metrics are expressed in terms of these four unknown functions, then one can turn the Einstein equations into an integral form which allow basically for an iterative scheme of a resolution one in which one starts for an initial from an initial guess for, for these functions and after a few iterations the solution converge to the to a, the desired solution characterized by some parameters given in input and then the past and current moments can be uh, can be read off from the can be read off the asymptotic uh, expansion of the of the function of the metric function so um, let's see uh, how the, the the boson star mass scales. So as I was as I was saying in this uh, in this large self coupling limit, uh, the coupling constant can be remo removed by uh, scaling to a dim dimension as quantities. But and they simply set the overall scale of the problem through this effective combination, which we call uh, MB, which has the dimension of a mass. So basically. Uh, from the dimensionless quantities, one can restore physical units by multiplying each dimensionless quantity by a given uh, by the, the a given power of MB to match the correct dimension in, uh, uh, in, uh, in mass of the, of the quantities. For example, the, the mass of the boson is so the mass of the boson star is simply given uh, in units of uh, of the effective coupling MB, and for uh, you can see, for example, that the for this model, the, the, the maximum allowed value for, uh, for no spinning boson stars is around 0 0.06 uh, MB, and this limit can be exceeded uh, uh, a bit considering the uh, spinning configuration. And if you want to explore the possibility of constraining uh, boson star with future observations, so we want, we want uh, the range of masses to be in the range of, uh, of current and future detectors. Uh, we can estimate um, what this range is by by um, considering um, a value around the maximum mass uh, for the for the spherically symmetric configurations, and then restoring physical units. Basically, one can see that the um, the whole range of, uh, of physical the whole spectrum of physical black holes can be reached by easily by varying the, the values of lambda and the values of the mass of the bosons and without even recurring to uh, ultralight scalar fields in, uh, in this model. So this is a, these are uh, our results for the, for the multiple moments of these, uh, of these rotating boson stars induced by the spin. And in this plot, you can see the quadruple and the octuple moment, uh, actually um, the reduced version of the quadruple and octuple moments um, the moments divided by uh, powers of chi and m in order to have the corresponding quantities for a black hole uh, to be both equal one. For example, if you look at the plot on the left, you can see the is a reduced quadruple moment as a function of the spin uh, for different values of the boson star mass, given uh, in terms of the, of the effective coupling of B. And basically, you see that the smaller is the mass of the boson star, which also means the smaller is the compactness, uh, the larger is the value of the, of the quadruple moment. And, uh, and that the maximum value uh, and that the minimum value of the quadruple moment corresponding to the most compact configuration is well disconnected by the, uh, the, value, uh, the, the, the value of one, which is the, the corresponding value for a black hole. Um, you can find the data and more about this in, in this work, this paper here, done with collaborators Sapienza, Costantino Pacilli, Andrea Maselli, and Paolo Pani. And also a discussion of this result in comparison with, uh, with previous works, from which we found slightly um, small deviations, as I, will, um, as I will say again in the, the very end of the talk. 
A thing that I would like to, uh, to mention is that we also found that the reduced quadruple and octuple moment are simply connected to the, to the tidal deformability of these objects. And in particular, if you take uh, the reduced quadruple and octuple moment as a function of tidal deformability in, in, a, in a log scale, this relation appears to be, to be linear. And also the relation between the, the quadruple and octuple themselves, which could be a hint of a, of, a, of a universal relation which could hold for boson stars as uh, they are known to hold for, uh, um, for neutron stars as well. So what we did with, the, with, the, with this data uh, that we provided for the multiple moments uh, is to build a coherent waveform model which consistently includes the different contribution from the multiple moments and the tidal formability um, to uh, um, to measure, to, to investigate the ability of feature detector to uh, constrain multiple moments and the scalar interactions. So the expression for the, for the quadruple moment can be, give, uh, can be, uh, can be given uh, in terms of the, of the reduced quadruple, um, which, is, which can be obtained as a function of the spin and of the mass of the, of the object by uh, interpolating basically the, the data that I showed uh, before. And the tidal deformability for these objects can be uh, obtained in terms of, the, of their mass and the effective coupling exploiting this relation, which is um, uh, given in, uh, in this paper, where this is the definition of the tidal deformability, which measures the response of the, of the object to the tidal field of the companion. And in this way, exploiting these two relations, we have that both tidal deformability and, and, uh, and the quadruples are function only of the of the um, on the mass, the spin, and the effective coupling of uh, of the theory. So they are um, coherently uh, included um, in the model. And then we built a, um, we focused on the on the spiral stage of the merger of, uh, of a binary boson star, and we modeled the the waveform in, uh, using a post Newtonian expansion in the, uh, the frequency domain. And we basically uh, truncated the amplitude at zero pn order, while in the phase which contained most of the physics of the problem, uh, we retained point particle terms up to 3.5 pn and add, adding quadruple corrections and tidal corrections coherently included in the, in the way that I showed before as function just of the masses, the spin, and the, the effective coupling. Of so then, uh, the idea was to um, was to study the ability of uh, of, uh, of LISA and in general of future detectors to measure directly the effective coupling uh, of the underlying scalar theory to observation of boson star binary. So directly uh, doing pa do parameter estimation and measure um, and investigate the the, pre the precision of the of a, of a measure of MB. And we used for this a fisher matrix approach uh, in, in this paper here, um, which uh, holds in the limit of large SNR. And we basically, um, so that the, the, in, in this limit, the, um, one has this expression of for the posterior as centered on the, on the true values of the, of the parameter. And then the uncertainty is simply given by the diagonal elements of the inverse of the, of the Fisher matrix. And what we obtained... Have about the three minutes left. Okay, thank you. And, and basically, uh, we consider the following scenario in which we have two uh, individual mass, which are the, um, uh, so with the, the, which are similar and are both uh, close to the, to the most compact configurations. We consider this, uh, this mass scale for the um, this range of values of MB, which reflects in this range of values of the masses uh, of the binaries, and three different configuration of the spin. Then what we found is that in this way, the error on the, on the effective coupling MB are even at the sub-percent level in the most optimistic configurations, which of course are the one in which the spin are larger, because these, uh, these are the configuration in which the, uh, also the, the quadruples enter and, uh, and play a role, which is um, a really uh, nice result that I have to point out that we did with the, in this work here, which 
um, was before we we had this new data for for the quadruple for the quadruples and the optical moments. So what we are doing now um, is to uh, devise a fuel Bayesian uh, analysis, of which here I show just a, this is just an, uh, this plot is just for illustrative purpose, but the idea is that uh, to do injecting and, reco and recovery of boson star binary signal with PLP, which is an inference uh, uh, library, to assess also the, the, the ability of current detectors to, uh, to measure the, the effective carbon, since here with lower SNR, um, the, the, given the lower SNR, the, the, the analysis uh, with the Fisher matrix will not work. And we hope that we will have soon results, uh, more results on these, even to confirm the results that we obtained in the matrix, which is just, uh, in any case, an explorative tool. So to conclude, we uh, provided accurate data for the multiple moments of rotating boson stars with the quantities of interactions in the strong coupling limit. Uh, we developed a weight for model for the spiral stage, which consistently uh, includes tidal and quadruple effects. Uh, the quadruple and doctrinal moments that we, uh, for which we provided data with our numerical methods um, agree with previous results for high spin, as I was saying before, but in the low spin region, we found that the absolute values are larger by a factor of respectively uh, two and three, which also means that this will increase our ability to uh, disentangle uh, boson stars from black holes using quadruples in multiple moments. We uncovered simple relations linking the multiple moments and tidal deformability, also known as the love Q relation. Um, and we show that LISA will be able to infer strong constraints on, uh, on fundamental coupling constants of the underlying scalar, scalar theory from observation of both star binary. So feature perspective and extension of this work uh, include repeating the analysis in a full Bayesian setting, as, uh, as I was saying, and including the more, uh, more accurate da data that we have, and considering different self-interaction, of course, uh, uh, in first place to study the universality degree of this over. Of course, we found them. We found simple relation just for uh, one realization of the self interactions, and and with different um, with different uh, boson star models and with different um, studying the impact on the multiple structure, we can also study the possibility to distinguish signal from different else models and perform model selection. And thank you for the attention. Thank you very much, uh, Massimo, for, for the uh, very interesting talk. Um, we have. Uh, oh, sorry, I, I, for... no, so I interrupt the, interrupted the, the, the screen sharing, but I can do it again if uh, there are questions that need the slides. Uh, okay, yes. Uh, trying to see if there are questions in the chat or hands up. I didn't see any. Um, Right, so I had a question, but uh, this is not uh, this is maybe a bit too open. Is uh, yeah, that uh, you find the university relations and this uh, this reminiscent of uh, this uh, I love Q and so on relations that were found in quite a lot of attentions for uh, not only uh, Newton stars. Um, do you want to uh, to comment on that? Or um, yes. Um... Uh, the thing is that even if we if one could expect some relation about the, the tidal deformability and, uh, and the quadruple moment in any case, it's, but it's, it's by no means by no means obvious that the relation should be so simple as the one that we uncover, which is basically that they are uh, have a, the relation is linear in you know, on, on, on a long scale. And I, I didn't mention this, but this holds in the in the in the low low, uh, low spin. Uh, region as it's true for also for, for neutron stars and so i would say that the that the fact that this relation is so simple can be an encouraging find that that this relation will also for, for different potentials but um i mean we there are no theoretical motivation for these and i would say that also for neutron star it's uh, it's not so obvious why they they all and 
in that case, they could be related with the fact that the, the, the equation of state on the uh, on the uh, beside the inner core, the equation of states are similar. In that case, this maybe the, the this this could be completely different for boson stars. So. Okay, it's, it's intriguing. Uh, in, uh, thanks. We also have a question from uh, Sayantani. Uh, please go ahead. Hello. Yeah, uh, thanks for the talk. Uh, I just had uh, one question, uh, which is from the slide where you showed the Bayesian analysis. So, and I noticed that it's for non spinning case. So, uh, and I guess you did using uh, the scaling relations you, uh, uh, you, uh, got uh, for the non-spinning case. Uh, I'm not sure, but I'm just wondering, is it uh, easy to extend this analysis for a spinning case as well? Uh, I'm not sure that I understood completely the question because I, I cannot hear you uh, very well. Uh, Are you asking about the tidal deformability relation? Uh, can yeah. you hear me well now? Yeah, maybe it's, it's better now. Uh, uh, to simplify my question, I'm just wondering for the Bayesian analysis case, could you is it is it easy ah. to extend for uh, spinning cases as well? Because I noticed that you have kept the spins at zero, so yeah, just a no. As I, I, okay, okay, no. As I said, as I said, the the, the you are referring to the corner plot in the in the last slide, right? Correct. Yes. Yes. Yeah. No. That that, that was just for an I mean for an illust illustrative purpose. So this is an ongoing work. But uh, yeah, we still we are still working on that. I mean, the, the corner plot comes from a, a, a real uh, injection and recovery. But yes, it's in the it's uh, just with the tidal, so does not uh, uh, prove uh, yet uh, my my point. The fact is that we are um, handling carefully the the correlation which arises be among different quantities, and so we are still uh, we still don't have. Um, uh, results on uh, on that for the fully uh, for the Bayesian analysis. So that plot was just to show the proof of concept, let's say. Okay, thanks. Okay, uh, thank you very much. We can uh, thank the, the speaker again for this uh, nice talk. Uh, and we're gonna move on to the next speaker. Uh, so Ankaj, if you want to share your screen. Yeah. All right. So the, the next talk is going to be by Pankaj Saini uh, on project and multiband constraints on the dipolar gravitational radiation from oxygen binary polar cores. Uh, so you have uh, 15 minutes, and I will give you an indication three minutes before the end. So okay. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, so my name is Pankaj. I'm a PhD student at Chennai Mathematical Institute, and I am working with Professor K.G. Arun. So first of all, I would like to thank the organizers for giving me the opportunity to present this work. And I'll be talking about the project, projected multi-band constraint on dipolar gravitation radiation from eccentric uh, binary black holes. Uh, so we know, as you know, in GR, that the lowest order gravitational radiation is quadrupolar in nature. Uh, the emission of uh, dipolar and the monopolar emission is forbidden due to the conservation of matter stress and energy tensor. And the luminosity of uh, this gravitational waves in GR goes as v to the power 10, where v is the velocity of the two compact objects in a binary system. And if the space time around these black holes or the compact objects is modified uh, due to the uh, due to the excitation of the scalar fields, this may induce the scalar uh, charges on these black holes. And when these black holes move around each other, uh, this may produce scalar waves, and these scalar waves carries away additional energy from the system and whose energy, whose luminosity goes as th this equation, um, which is proportional to the difference in the scalar charges of the two bodies and velocity to the power eight. So this difference of the powers of two comes due to the fact that this radiation is dipolar in nature. And these changes will appear as a correction in the gravitational phase as can be seen from this equation the gravitational phase is proportional to the difference in the scalar charges of the two bodies and v to the power minus two. So in the post-Newtonian counting, this v to the power minus two term is known as the negative 1pn term, which dominates at low velocities or low frequencies. 
and this change can also be seen from this plot so this plot shows the gravitational wave forms in gr and in modified gravity so due to the additional loss of energy from the system uh, the merger of these black holes will uh, will will happen at an earlier time than in gr uh, so currently the gravitational wave detectors observe these compact binaries very close to their merger when the binaries are moving very fast and if there is any dipole radiation it will be suppressed at this stage and as i said the dipolar radiation is a low frequency effect and lisa will be observing in the low frequency spectrum and when the binaries are far apart and moving slowly so the lisa will be very effective in detecting the presence of dipolar radiation and furthermore if we can combine the low frequency observation with the high frequency observations of the ground based detectors such as cosmic explorer and einstein telescope this may further lead to an improvement in the dipole bound so currently uh, ligo vergo uses the quasi circular waveform for the parameter estimation and testing gr but it is also very likely that when these binaries are in spiraling in the lisa band they still possess some residual eccentricity so uh, so the eccentricity is a sharply decreasing function of gravitational frequency as i said the emission of gravitational waves carries away the energy and angular momentum from the system and the emission of bind the emission of uh, binding energy tends to decrease the orbit of the binary and the emission of angular momentum tends to circularize the orbit of the binary and this circularization happens very fast as can be seen from this plot so if you start with a very high centric binary around 0.9 which is emitting at 10 to the power minus 2 hertz in the laser band and by the time this binary enters the frequency band of the ground based detector the binary becomes almost circular but uh, there are some formation channels such as the dynamical formation of compact binaries in dense environments such as globular clusters and the nuclear star clusters which can produce highly eccentric binaries and when these highly eccentric binaries enter the ground based detectors they still possess some residual eccentricity and there have been numerous work on this topic so if we use the quasi circular waveform for the parameter estimation of these eccentric sources and uh, this will introduce the systematic bias in the estimated parameters and these systematic biases will mimic may mimic the deviations from gr so in this work we will quantify the effect of eccentricity on the dipole bound and see how this dipole bounds are changing when we uh, use the eccentric waveform instead of circular waveform so to to give an overview of the systematic biases so these biases are the difference between the best fit value of the parameter which maximizes the likelihood to the data and the true value of the parameter so if we consider an approximate waveform which is given by the approximate amplitude and the approximate phase so in our case this approximate waveform is a circular waveform and then there are eccentric corrections to the amplitude and the phase delta a eccentric and delta psi eccentric so and using the cutler and velisnery formalism uh, we can calculate the systematic biases on these parameters so which is given by equation 4 and the sigma ab is the covariance matrix which is calculated using the approximate waveform so in our analysis we neglect the eccentric corrections to the amplitude but consider only the eccentric corrections to the phase so uh, and we use a taylor f2 eccentric uh, waveform model so this waveform model can be decomposed into the circular and the eccentric part of the waveform this circular part is the standard circular 3.5 pn phase and the structure of this uh, eccentric phase can be seen from this expression so this is an expansion in powers of v and v not and this phasing incorporates the leading order effect of eccentricity which is e not e square and this v not is defined as pi m f not where f not is the reference frequency at which we define our initial eccentricity e not and this waveform is valid in the small eccentricity limit uh, less than 0.2 so all these uh, waveforms are in gr as i said so we want to correct these waveforms for the dipole correction so for that uh, what we do we parameterize the gravitational flux as equation 7 so this is the gravitational the gravitational wave flux and this is the leading order gr flux and this b is called the dipole flux parameter which quantifies the strength of the dipole emission and these 
corrections to the phase will be propagated to the gravitational phase which which is shown in equation 8 and 9 for the circular and the eccentric part so in the circular part these corrections appear like this and in the eccentric part these corrections appear like this so using this we calculate the bounds on this uh, dipole parameter and we use the uh, fisher information matrix to get the bounds on these uh, parameters which gives the one sigma weight of the distribution around this uh, around these parameters and our parameters of the waveforms are the tc phi c the time and phase of coalescence and m is the total mass and eta is the symmetric mass ratio the chi 1 chi 2 are the two dimensionless spins of the binary and b is the dipole flux parameter and now we calculate the statistical and systematic errors in the laser band due to the neglect of eccentricity and see at what eccentricity this systematic biases become significant over the statistical errors and we fix the observation time for laser four years so in this plot uh, we show the systematic and the statistical errors systematic errors are shown by the slanted line and the statistical errors by the horizontal line and this this is e naught e naught is the eccentricity initial eccentricity which we defined at 10 to the power minus 2 hertz and this is for 15 to 9 14 like system because for four years of observations these systems enter the frequency band of lisa at this frequency so as the eccentricity of the source increases uh, the systematic biases increases and becomes comparable to the statistical error at an eccentricity of 2 into 10 to the power minus 3 and becomes an order of uh, magnitude larger at 10 to the power minus 2. So if you see that if a source with an eccentricity of around 10 to the power minus 3 is observed in the laser band, the systematic biases will be more uh, than the statistical errors and it will contaminate the bounds on these uh, dipole parameters and it may lead us to claim a false deviation from GR. So this is our motivation. Now we now if we use the eccentric waveform and and see like what are the effect of this eccentric waveform uh, on these dipole bounds. So for that, so in uh, Barase et al have studied the multiband bound on the dipole term using using the circular binaries. So now we extend their work by using the eccentric waveform. So for that. Uh, we consider a uh, 300 binary black holes distributed uniformly in a foam moving volume up to a luminosity distance of one gigaparsec because LISA may not be able to see these stellar mass binary black holes beyond uh, a of 0.2. And the masses of these binary black holes are drawn from zero root C3 like population, which follow the power law plus peak model. And uh, the spins are assumed to be aligned or anti aligned with, the, with respect to the angular momentum of the binary. And the magnitude of the spins are drawn from the default spin model. And the eccentricity of these uh, binary black holes is assumed to follow a uniform distribution, uh, which are defined at 10 to the power minus 2 hertz. Uh, so most of these star mass binary black holes uh, will be quiet in the laser band. So here quiet, I mean, will be indistinguishable from the noise in the laser band. Uh, so it depends on the what are the SNRs of these sources in the laser band. So in an idealized template bank requires an SNR of 14 to 15 in the laser band, but which can further be lowered to nine with the help of ground-based detectors because ground-based detectors measure the source parameters pretty well. And this SNR can further be reduced to four to five with the help of ground-based detectors. So in our case, we choose a laser SNR threshold to be four. And with this SNR threshold, only 5% of our binary black hole population crosses this uh, SNR criteria. And using this 5% of the sources, we calculate the one sigma combined bound on the dipole term. So uh, this plot shows the bounds on the dipole flux parameter in the different uh, detectors. So uh, if you see in the cosmic explorer band, the bounds are of the order of 10 to the power minus five. And in the Einstein telescope, the Einstein telescope does little better. Uh, the bounds are over 10 to the power minus 6 because, because of the better low frequency sensitivity of the Einstein telescope. And as expected, uh, the LISA does a much better job. The bounds are over 10 to the power minus 9, which are three orders of magnitude better compared to the ground-based detectors. This is because the 
at low frequencies the dipole radiation is abundant and the dipole radiation is dominated at low frequencies so lisa can measure these uh, bounds very precisely and further if we can combine the low frequency observations of lisa with the high frequency observations of the ground based detectors the bounds further improves by an order of magnitude that becomes ground say, you have a uh, few minutes left about okay thanks uh, so if we combine the bound from the uh, space based detectors and the ground based detectors the bounds further increase further improves by an order of magnitude and this is because of the breaking degeneracy is be between the various parameters in the waveform so when we add the two feature matrices from the two detectors uh, the several off diagonal terms cancel away and it gives a better estimation of the parameters and similarly as we combine the lisa with the einstein telescope observations it gives a similar kind of bound and adding a further detector does not improve the bound much so now if we use an eccentric waveform over these eccentric uh, sources uh, the bounds becomes little weaker in all the detectors and this is expected because now you are adding an extra parameter to the waveform and so the information available in the signal is distributed among the different parameters and because of various correlation with, of eccentricity with the other parameters the bounds becomes little weaker and if you want to combine this if you want to compare these bounds with the currently best measured bounds of gw17 or 17 these bounds lie here which are of the order of 10 to the power minus 5 and so if you see that the the, the combined multiband bounds are four orders of magnitude uh, better than the currently best measured gravitational wave bounds and further, if you want to compare with the pulsar uh, bounds, uh, these bounds lie here. So the circular one does a little better job, but the eccentric ones are a little weaker compared to the pulsar bounds. And pulsar bounds are very, uh, pulsars are very effective in constraining the dipole term. This is because of the longer observation of these sources. And because in this case, it was a 16 years of observation. So, but uh, how these bounds will map to the actual actual bounds de will depend on the properties of these sources and the particular theory is considered. Uh, so to conclude that a subpopulation of binary black holes may have no negligible eccentricity when they are observed in the ground-based detectors, and using the quasi-circular waveform for the eccentric sources will introduce systematic biases in the estimated parameter. And this may this may mimic uh, the deviations from GR if the systematic errors become greater than the statistical errors. And we found that in the LISA band, the systematic biases on the dipole term becomes greater than the statistical errors at an eccentricity of 10 to the power minus 3 and 10 to the power minus 2 hertz. So uh, considering a more realistic eccentric binary black hole population uh, modifies this dipole bound to 4 to 7 times becomes worse than the than the circular counterparts. So thank you very much. Now I can take questions. Thank you very much for the very interesting talk. Uh, so we have time for questions now. Okay, I don't see any question uh, for now. So maybe I can ask for, uh, one myself. So when you talk about the combined uh, bounds that you get from Lisa plus uh, 3G uh, detectors, um, I understand that you have done it with, uh, uh, with all the parameters, but uh, did you look at uh, what are the parameters that bring you most information? What I'm thinking of is, is there is an approximate way of uh, representing the same multiband observations, which would be essentially take these observations and then say that the ground base tells you the time of measure. Primarily, because that's what it measures very well, and that Lisa does not measure uh, very well. Um, do you have a sense of how how good that approximation would be? Uh, sorry, I I could not uh, follow the question properly. You are breaking for me a little bit. Can you say that again, please? Yes, yeah, sorry. Uh, I, I was wondering because uh, when you combine information from the Lisa band and the three uh, G band. Uh, there is one distinctive uh, information that the uh, things the measure brings you uh, is uh, really the time of measure. Um, time, time, and sorry, uh, time of uh, what is it? Time of coalescence, time of oh, measure. Okay. Yes, yes, yeah. 
So I would expect that this is the dominant information that helps you uh, reducing the, the bounds. Uh, I understand that you did more than this. I was just curious whether you, you checked that this is indeed the main information that you take. Yeah, so time of fluorescence is one of the reasons which is, which improve this bound, but then this uh, uh, other parameters such as, uh, uh, yeah, so the shelf mass can also be measured well in the Lisa band, but there are some other parameters uh, like eccentric. Uh, uh, so I'm not sure particularly like which parameter contributes more to the improvement of the bound, but as you said, the time of fluorescence can be one of them. Uh, but I think it's not just the time of policy, but it's a combination of all the parameters, I think, which improves the bounds when we combine the two pressure matrices. So for that, you need to check like which of the off-diagonal off terms cancels in corresponding to that entry of the element. I see. Thank you. Um, okay, uh, let me see. I don't think we have other questions. So let's thank the speaker again for this very nice talk. Uh, and we can move on to the uh, next speaker now. Uh, so Giovanni, if you want to share your screen. Yes. All right. So in this next talk, Giovanni Maria Tomaselli will, uh, from the University of Amsterdam, is going to talk about ionization of gravitational atoms. So you have 15 minutes. I will tell you a few minutes before the end. Uh, and uh, for this. Okay, thanks a lot. Um, I'm Giovanni Maria Tomaselli, PhD student at the University of Amsterdam. And um, thanks for giving me the opportunity to talk. Um, here I will talk about gravitational atoms in uh, binary systems. So, um, oops, okay. So this talk is based on uh, work done with um, professors Daniel Bauman and Gianfranco Bertone at the University of Amsterdam. Uh, together with John Stout from Harvard. And uh, there are actually two versions of this work, a long and detailed version and, and a short version, uh, which focuses more on the um, uh, gravitational wave observables. And it's more readable and is free of uh, many technical details. And also I have to say that this work builds on uh, previous papers by other people in Amsterdam who have studied um, similar topics. Okay, so um, fundamental physics with gravitational waves. So if you ask uh, a particle physicist how to discover new particles, they would likely say, go to higher energy. And in fact, this is how historically most particles have been discovered. However, it is possible that new physics actually hides at weaker coupling rather than higher energy. And in this sense, as we will see, uh, black holes and gravitational waves are can, can be a probe of, uh, of new physics, for example, of fields who may couple only gravitationally to the standard model. Um, what kind of new physics are we considering here? Ultralight bosons, we mainly focus on scalars. And by ultralight, I mean uh, with mass less than about 10 to the minus 10 electron volts. Now the motivation for these um, particles is uh, mainly twofold. There are several theoretical models of um, beyond standard model physics who predict such, such uh, axions or axion-like particles, but there are also phenomenological models such as uh, models of dark matter who um, employ this uh, kind of uh, uh, ultralight uh, uh, hypothetical particle. Um, why are these ultralight bosons interesting when uh, talking about black holes? It's because of the super radiance instability. So basically, this is the uh, wave analog of the Penrose process. Um, if you take a care black hole, and if in nature there is a, such an ultralight boson field, the care black hole is actually unstable in that um, scalar modes around the black hole will grow exponentially with time. Their occupation number will grow exponentially. Um, now, the most interesting thing about superradiance is that it only needs uh, two ingredients, a spinning black hole and um, a boson with about the right mass. Um, you don't need any background density, any other assumption. If you have these two ingredients, you get superradiance. Uh, what is the right mass? 
well, you can only be, you only construct one dimensionless parameter, this alpha, it's called um, the gravitational fine structure constant, which is basically the ratio of the uh, gravitational radius of the black hole to the Compton wavelength of the field. And for um, about solar mass black holes, then the mass of the scalar mu uh, has to be around 10 to the minus 10 electron volts. If you uh, take um, more massive black holes, then mu has to be correspondingly lighter. Um, the mass um, in the cloud uh, can be actually up to 10% of the mass of the black hole. That is quite a lot of mass. And another interesting and maybe surprising thing about uh, superannians is that the final uh, state of the system resembles the hydrogen atom. This is actually, uh, this should actually be that surprising in that the um, gravitational potential at large distances scales as one over R, just like the Coulomb potential. And therefore you get um, hydrogenic wave functions labeled by the same quantum numbers you find in uh, atomic physics. That is one, N for um, the energy, and then two, L and M for the angular momentum. Only some of these states will be unstable and will grow uh, due to superradiance. The fastest one is generally two on one. Um, okay, so our goal is to study what happens when such a system, such a black hole plus cloud called gravitational atom, because of this analogy, is placed uh, in a binary system. Um, so we mostly have in mind intermediate to extreme mass ratio spirals, where we can talk about a big black hole with a cloud and a small object that orbits around it and is eventually in spirals um, in the cloud. So the orbiting companion will perturb the cloud uh, with its gravitational potential at increasing frequency. Um, there has been some work, um, some previous work by people in Amsterdam mainly, um, but also other, other people, um, that found uh, orbital resonances in that at specific uh, orbital frequencies that match the um, energy difference between different states of the cloud, uh, transitions between different states of the cloud can be triggered. So the cloud can, can go to a state with lower energy to uh, one with higher energy or vice versa. And the back reaction of this process on the orbit can create so-called floating orbits or sinking orbits, depending on whether the orbit is um, in spiraling uh, quicker or slower than expected um, in vacuum. In a generically later stage of the spiral, when the companion goes actually through the cloud, it is expected that um, there must be some sort of dynamical friction because it's going through such a dense medium. Um, and this will in general change the dynamics of the system and therefore the ensuing um, gravitational waveform. So how do we compute um, self-consistently this effect? And this is the main um, topic of this work. Well, um, the spectrum of, uh, I was showing before is actually not complete. Uh, to have a complete spectrum, you have to add these um, towers of unbound states, which have energy greater than zero um, and correspond to free particles, which are which feel the gravitational attraction of the black hole, but are nonetheless free to escape to infinity. When the um, orbital frequency is uh, low enough, um, lower than the separation between, the energy separation between the bound state and the continuum, um, then transitions between the bound state and the continuum cannot happen because the fundamental quantum of energy that is given by the companion is not high enough. But when the uh, companion uh, um, uh, goes over this threshold frequency, then it can excite uh, these uh, transitions between the bound state and the continuum in analogy to what we call the photoionization in atomic physics or photoelectric effect, if you want. In that case as well, it's very well known that there is a certain threshold energy above which the effect can actually happen. So how do we compute this? If you want to do this properly, taking into account the um, uh, in spiral of the companion, it's actually pretty technically involved, but 
um, the, the main result is correctly capture, captured by Fermi's golden rule applied as if the companion was not spiraling. This means that schematically, the transition rate between the bound state and the continuum, this gamma, um, is proportional to the um, so-called level mixing, that is the matrix element of the perturbation between the initial and the final state. And this delta function is taking care uh, of um, selecting the states in the continuum with the correct amount of energy. Um, you can sum that up, you can sum that rate up all, over um, all unbound states uh, to get the total, what we call ionization power, so the total amount of energy per, per unit time that the binary pumps into the cloud. Um, now we can evaluate this numerically to find this plot. So um, a, few, a few comments are, are in order about this plot. On, uh, so on the x-axis, I'm showing the orbital separation under the assumption of quasi-circular orbits um, in units of the half uh, Schwarzschild radius. On the y-axis, I'm showing the ionization power um, normalized by the power emitted in gravitational waves. So you may notice that the scale of y-axis is large. This means that the um, ion this ionization process can actually extract from the binary more energy than gravitational waves, even by orders of magnitude. And this is, what I'm showing this plot is even a conservative estimate in some sense. Second, you may notice that um, the ionization power has these jumps, these discontinuities. So what's going on? Um, well, I told you before that there is a threshold activation frequency for uh, ionization to happen. Well, actually, the gravitational perturbation is not monochromatic. So you can decompose it in uh, Fourier components and each uh, monochromatic uh, uh, component will contribute, um, say, independently and have a different uh, activation frequency. And it, at, uh, all these activation frequencies, you will get these, uh, these continuities. Now, if you do things properly and take into account the radial um, uh, motion of the companion, that is the non-zero rate of spiral, you find that these, are, of course, are not actual discontinuities. Um, they are smoothened out by, by oscillations, but with uh, realistic parameters, these oscillations are very short, so these are effectively discontinuous features. Now, before uh, exploring how this ionization um, changes the uh, evolution of the system, um, I want to say that we also include another effect, uh, which is the accretion of the cloud onto the companion in case it is a black hole. Um, this effect, if you want, it's somewhat less interesting than ionization in that it doesn't have these uh, discontinuity or stuff like that. However, it is important because um, the, the companion, the black hole in this case, is going through such a dense medium. So if you... If you didn't take into account ionization, you would find actually the um, fractional uh, increase of mass would be even of order one. Uh, this is somewhat um, decreased by the inclusion of ionization, but we, it's still uh, an order uh, point one uh, effect. So we have to take that into account. Okay. So to, to see so the. Germany, you have uh, about the three minutes. Thanks. So to see the um, effect of ionization and accretion on, uh, on the dynamics, we do, uh, we saw a very simple case just in the um, Newtonian approximation uh, for quasi-circular orbits. I know this is a toy model, but it does show the main effects and observables of the effect. So we solve for three um, uh, variables, which are the uh, orbital separation of frequency, the uh, mass of the companion, and the mass of the cloud. So the first plot I want to show is that is the evolution of this separation as function of time for um, an intermediate mass ratio in spiral. So the black line is what you would have if there was no cloud. The blue and uh, the um, orange thick lines are the full solution of the system, including both um, ionization and accretion in case the, the binary is co-rotating or counter-rotating with the cloud. 
As you can see, the inspiral is shortened by even uh, hundreds of years in this case. And in general, um, as soon as the ionization power overcomes um, the power emitting gravitational waves, there is sort of a plunge um, here and here, and the, the merger happens much quicker. But perhaps the most um, interesting feature that is imprinted in the gravitational waveform is seen uh, plotting the orbital frequency, which here is rescaled um, in such a way that um, to lowest order, the vacuum case looks like a straight line. So you see that the frequency has these kinks at some specific uh, orbital frequency or orbital separations. These are, of course, uh, the direct consequence of the quasi-discontinuous features in the ionization power. So a discontinuity in the ionization power translates into a discontinuity of the first derivative of the frequency. Now, the position um, and in some sense the amplitude of these kinks in the frequency evolution are directly linked to fundamental physics like the mass of the boson in terms of the uh, fine structure parameter alpha introduced before and um, the, uh, the state of the cloud here which enters by uh, the, the principal quantum number n. And it happens that for an intermediate mass ratio in spiral, these kinks fall in the Lisa band, are about in the millihertz uh, range. So uh, in conclusion, when you have such a, um, such a system, such a gravitational atom in a binary, the spiral dynamics is changed so much um, that it's not, uh, just perturbed by the presence of the cloud, but it's driven by it. And um, if we use vacuum waveforms um, to find such systems, we may fail. Um, oh, there are uh, undergoing studies about that um, because the evolution is so different. And it's not just a perturbation. And in general, um, there are sharp features that carry direct information on um, the spectrum of the cloud that come in the form of resonances in, about the floating or kicked um, orbits or the kinks in the uh, evolution of the frequency uh, I talked in, in the previous slide. So we didn't do generic waveform modeling because this needs to extend to um, eccentric orbits, inclined orbits uh, and introduce uh, uh, relativistic corrections. And also we are studying the interplay of resonances and ionization. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much for the nice talk. We have time uh, for uh, for questions. Uh, so you can raise your hand or post in the chat if you want. So we'll go on from Johannes, go ahead. Yeah, thank you very much for the for the nice talk. Um, I was just trying to get some intuition and I could probably work this out from the formula on one of the previous slides. When you have the when you have these kinks in the frequency for what range of masses uh, is this going to end up lying in the in the lisa band like what kind of mass range will i guess will be best constrainable with lisa observations yeah so i guess uh, this formula answers your question mm -hmm. um for an intermediate mass ratio in spiral where the companion object is uh, um, solar mass object so sorry i meant i meant the the mass that's i guess uh, encoded in the alpha so I guess the mass of the... Oh, right, uh, right. Um, correct, yeah. This would be around 10 to the minus 14 electron volts. Okay, and the plus minus a little bit, the, the just, I guess, the doing the scaling in my head. So whereas 10 to the minus uh, 14, you were saying electron volts plus minus, what kind of range are we talking? Well, it depends. Uh, again, you can play with these numbers. So I'm saying 10 to the minus 14 because uh, I'm taking the mass of the black hole equal to 10 to the four solar masses. And for a solar mass black hole, you have 10 to the minus 10, and it scales inversely. Mm -hmm. So uh, if you, yeah, it depends on the mass of the central black hole. Uh, you have to play with these two numbers. I would say plus or minus one order of magnitude. Um, okay, that's perfect. Great. Thanks a lot, Giovanni. Thanks. Okay. Uh... If there is no other question, maybe I can ask one myself. Uh, right, so you shown that uh, you get very strong uh, effects 
um, I think, when dominating gravitational emission. Uh, what happens if you turn the, the problem around and, and ask uh, what finding detecting normal looking signals would give you as constraints? Uh, what kind of uh, energy uh, mass range can you exclude uh, for uh, flag bosons in this way? So, sorry, um, can, can you repeat the, the, first part, the first part of the question? You say, um, I got a very strong effect and... Uh, right, so if you turn, turn this around, if we see uh, a signal that is as expected without yeah. any modifications, we can turn this into a constraint and exclude the existence oh. of like, bosons in certain range. So what happens if you turn it in this right, way? Right, right, right. So, um, so it is um, it's somewhat tricky. I would say it's very easy to um, find, um, um, you know, to recognize a detection, but it's easy to put an exclusion with this method because, uh, for example, the cloud has a finite lifetime. It, the cloud is long lived, but can, for example, decay um, if the scalar is a real uh, field in gravitational wave and dissipate over a certain amount of time. So it depends if the uh, in spiral happens before the cloud has dissipated, we're going to see this effect. But it's possible the boson is present in nature, the cloud dissipates, and then the spiral happens. In that case, we will not see the cloud. So it is a bit tricky. <laughs> um, okay, I see. It, it depends on the history of the system. I don't think there is an, an easy answer to that. Okay. Uh... And there is another question from Samson. Yeah, hello. Thank you for your talk. Uh, I have a very naive question. So since you're saying that uh, it could be possible that uh, you have a boson cloud around the central black hole, so could it happen that a, a companion also have a boson cloud around it? And then instead of having a gravitational atom, now you have a gravitational molecule. Okay. And <laughs> could, I mean, if, that, if this effect is even observable or do we need yes. to care about this? Oh, in fact, gravitational molecule is a term some people have used. Uh, however, um, superradiance is only efficient when these ratio scales, so say the mass, uh, say the, the gravitational radius of the black hole to the Compton wavelength of the field is of order one, right? So the same field um, cannot be responsible for superradiance if there's a large mass ratio. Uh, you need uh. to take two different fields in a large mass ratio scenario. What you said is, however, relevant if you have an equal mass ratio in spiral. In that case, the same field can be responsible for superradiance around both objects. And in fact, when the orbital separation becomes uh, uh, smaller than the radius of the, um, of the clouds, uh, you have what you said, a gravitational molecule, so a state around the orbiting binary. I see, I see. But for, for okay, technical reasons, yeah. we need the, the mass ratio to be large. Um, for our right. applications to hold. Right, it makes sense. Right. Thank you. Okay, if there are no other questions, I think we can stop here. Uh, so we uh, can thank all, uh, all the speakers of the session. Uh, and uh, we will have now uh, a long break during which you are encouraged to look at uh, Protocol talks and posters. And the uh, uh, plenary sessions are going to start again in uh, a bit less than uh, uh, one and a half hours. So uh, thank you all for attending today. Thanks, Sylvan. Thanks, everybody. And thanks, okay. Michael, for your help. No, not at all. I'm 